a very warm welcome, um, everyone, to our event on a very busy day. Uh, today is the Climate Finance Day, uh, so I guess um, everybody has been, you know, busy um, attending event, full of the buzzword about, you know, finance, how we can how we can mobilize finance, what kind of innovative finance um, uh, mechanisms we can uh, we can um, uh, scale up. Um, so um, today we are uh, really pleased to invite everybody to attend our special um, side event, um, uh, which will be focusing on unlocking capitals for a net zero future, uh, insights and experience from sustainable finance hubs. So my name is Bebe Gu, um, I'm uh, from the Shanghai-based Green Finance Forum of 60. We are Shanghai-based think tank. Um, uh, working towards um, promoting sustainable finance and uh, you know elevated role of finance for climate actions and sustainabilities. So we are really uh, uh, thrilled uh, to to be able to collaborate with the Climate Works Foundation, with the UN um, ESCAP, um, and also with CBI to bring together um, this event and uh, to discuss this timely topic uh, with us. Um, I'm very pleased to be joined with uh, um, a very a very distinguished um, panelist um, with us from uh, the UN organizations, from the multilateral development banks, from academia and international NGOs. So we will be in the next hours hearing from them, their perspectives, their experiences on how uh, we can help unlock uh, the capital that is that is required for subnational um, uh, levels. Um, so yeah. Um, so now let's begin. Um, first of all, it is my honor to invite uh, Dr. Kim Namshin, the Assistant uh, General, uh, Director General and Head of Investment of Policy Solutions Division from the Global Green Growth, Growth Institute to give us an introductory remark. Please welcome. Thank you. Um, um, I'm very much honored like, uh, to make a very brief presentation. Uh, it's going to be very brief because this is a good time for me to, uh, to get more update from your, your like, uh, views and perspective. So um, I'm Assistant Director General of uh, GGGI, Global Green Growth Institute. This is like, uh, uh, we are working with 70 countries, including 50 member countries, and the whole total member of, uh, number of our staff, 800 people. And then uh, today's discussion, I'm just focused on four main topics, very briefly. The first one is that mentioned by uh, our um, uh, MC. This is very important. Like uh, we need to understand like uh, how can boost up like uh, green climate financing, strong collaboration with the subnational, subnational entity. Second one is that I want to share with you my experience, such as, such as like a. Uh, significant uh, sustainable financing. Can you hear my voice? Yes. Uh, sustainable financing and infrastructure financing. My lessons learned and how can we boost up this one in close collaboration with our counterpart. Last point is partnership. partnership. So I'm great to see like uh, together with you GF GF40 forum. Absolutely, this is very important like uh, partnership, strong partners. Uh, I think we GGI can also get benefit from this Lovely, like a uh, uh, strong collaboration with all of you. Let me go straight to the first point: the role of sustainable finance hubs, particularly at some national level, in accelerating the transition to net zero. Some national platforms, such as city level, urban level, or regional, or regional like uh, uh, financial hub, are emerging as key drivers of crime in finance. They need like a strong like uh, uh, resources, but very much agile. And then they have a very much like on-site local experience. And then stakeholders' engagement, very important, require unlock crime action at the ground level. So I think this is really important. So we really want to uh, closely work with like uh, local level uh, municipality, local financial institution, and community-based green financing platform. Currently, we are actually doing a similar project in across all the regions, five regions. And then this is a good time maybe we can share with you our, our success story in the collaboration with the urban and um, uh, municipal level like uh, uh, collaboration. Second point, usually people are saying that climate finance is very much important, but how can get access to climate financing? 
we can share with you our like a story during the last uh, several years. We actually achieved two billion billion US dollars crime financing, in comprising sustainable financing and infrastructure financing. Sustainable financing, for instance, two weeks ago Uzbekistan we successfully support issuance of the green bonds, one billion US dollar, working with Agro Bank and then uh, SQB uh, and then uh, QS, uh, SQB uh, Bank. This is for a uh, climate smart agriculture project development in Uzbekistan. We are currently being approached by Kazakhstan and other neighboring country. They are very much concerned about uh, RRCs. RRCs like uh, depletion. So this is another way we can support this our like, uh, team. Also, uh, we are the, the first institute to support Debt for Nature Swap. Uh, Ecuador, Galapagos, 650 million US dollars. And then we also another like a story, three, more than 3 billion US dollars sustainable green bond for Peru. So currently this is like a system, sustainable financing. We are not trying to expand our scope work. More than eight country. Happy to, to further discuss and support you. So the point, blended financing facility. Many like uh, uh, people saying that Oh, I have a beautiful project. We spent two years to develop this kind of project, but unfortunately, there's no financing. Financing is very much like uh, not difficult, uh, already a tangible project. More is already there. So then we can say that all stage of project development identification, we need also identify potential financial, like, uh, like a commercial bank or international organization or bilateral development agency. With this, like uh, their like uh, uh, intervention collaboration, we can start preparing like a uh, nice uh, policy regulatory site and identification project and the pre and the feasibility study. Next stage will be ready for investment with the financing. We actually achieved uh, a lot of like uh, uh, infrastructure project in the area of a solar PV project, 600 megawatt of Madhya Pradesh, India. And then green uh, hydrogen. Currently, we are working in three countries, in the, including Indonesia, and then uh, also Nigeria. Foreign gas, uh, foreign gas optimization, sustainable transport in 16 countries, energy efficiency, Swiss government project in, in Cambodia, for instance, bio charcoal in Vietnam, and then uh, bio hydrogen, Java, 330 million US dollars, small project, but can be another big, another huge like uh, project or uh, development. Also, Kigali, uh, city, Green City Project Kigali in Rwanda is, can be another good example. So infrastructure project is very important from our perspective. But our target is like, uh, once we develop project, it must be matched with the financing. No financing, we call this one, it's not project. But lastly, like, uh, I need to uh, uh, emphasize the important uh, highlight, the important, uh, importance of a partnership in advancing this agenda. Green Finance Forum of 60, alongside the partners such as Crime Works Foundation, UN SCAP, and the ADB and climate also bond initiative. You present a kind of multi-stakeholder approach. Very important. We really need this one. So I'm very happy to see here all of you and sharing our knowledge and best ex experience. And we try to contribute to this kind of strong partnership, help them to go reach out of the project development, green finance infrastructure, and the sustainable finance project with the financing match. Uh, please allow me to, to conclude that the road to net zero is not without the challenge, but it is also full of opportunities. Opportunities. All the challenges will have uh, opportunity to succeed. Innovative finance platforms are at the front of the transformation, providing a critical link between high-level climate commitment and reality on the ground. So uh, this is like a great time to discuss more stay close and then i really want to see your uh, significant uh, very uh, amazing insightful ideas on how we can collectively work toward a resilient inclusive and sustainable world thank you very much thank you very much uh, dr shane for sharing uh 
quite a lot of uh, uh, successful stories actually GGGI has been um, implementing and deploying um, climate finance in a lot of the um, developing countries and also I take note of the, the keywords that you have been highlighting uh, uh, se several times uh, which is partnership uh, the importance of uh, um, um, uh, fostering and uh, um, um, formulating constructive um, um, partnerships among different stakeholders to towards this collective goal. Okay, so um, let's now uh, move to the um, next session. Um, we, we are going to have a fireside chat with uh, uh, four really exciting um, panelists. Uh, but before that, I'll, I'll just take uh, two quick minutes to quickly highlight um, uh, the, you know, the, 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 some of the global pictures that we thought might be relevant for today's discussion. So first of all, um, a global imperative of sustainable financial centers uh, towards the net zero transition. Uh, this is what we hear that uh, we, we saw that since uh, probably after 2016, um, international uh, financial centers, uh, um, for example, such as London, Dubai, Singapore, um, and uh, more recently, um, the, the, the uh, financial centers in China, like Shanghai, Beijing, um, and also Hong Kong, have all clearly put forward um, a clear vision in um, developing and uh, construction um, a, a, a world-class green finance center, really putting green finance and sustainable finance at the center of the city's um, strategy and development plan so um, we do see that a lot of um, a lot of um, global um, financial centers um, now would be actively wanted to um, focus on deepening and strengthening uh, its uh, green finance market um, and uh, we are we are also um, part of that process uh, for example as a Shanghai based uh, uh, think tank to uh, help the Shanghai government uh, to towards achieve that Goal. And uh, also quickly uh, to the next page. Um, this is the, an assessment um, done by the by the global um, uh, cities climate finance um, 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 leadership alliance, uh, which actually um, identified the, you know the current climate finance flows that are invested into the cities. We have seen that um, for the past uh, few years, since 2017 to 2020. One in the past five years, the um, the mobilized finance flows have already doubled um, at the current level of about 800 billion um, U.S. dollars per year into the into the urban um, climate finance. But this is still far not enough from what is actually required and needed for the uh, for the cities to achieve its uh, sustainable development goals by 2030. So it is estimated that uh, by 2030, the cities will need uh, on average four trillion U.S. US dollars per year um, um, uh, investment, which means we need to scale up uh, from the current level five times more. And uh, in from 2030 to 2050, um, it will need about six trillion, um, six trillion dollars. So we are really talking about huge um, amount of um, capital that are needed. So with that, uh, I would like to invite our um, four panelists um, on the stage for an, a stimulating and insightful conversations on how we can act catalyzing the, the, much, the much required finance for net zero transition at the subnational level, at the city level. So let me first welcome Ms. Subha uh, Shiva Kumar Ran, uh, Chief of Section from UNSCAP, please be on the stage. Mr. Sean Kinney, CEO of uh, Climate Bonds Initiative. Uh, Mr. Bob Watt, Interim Director, Graham Research Institute on Climate and Investment uh, and Environment (LSE), and also Mr. Ji Lin, um, Senior Climate Officer uh, from ADB, to be on the stage. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, um, a very warm welcome, and uh, um, I guess um, the first round of in, in intervention, I'll, I'll, I'll like um, every one of you to just give um, a very brief um, opening statement, uh, maybe briefly um, 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 introduce your, yourself, your, your organization, and also help us to unpack this trillion dollar question, <laughs> you know, how, how we can help cities to mobilize um, sustainable finance more more effectively yeah I'll, I'll first uh, uh, I'll 
I'll first maybe turn to um, Mr. Ward because I, I hear that um, um, this morning there is a new global assessment report that has been announced. So um, would you maybe f take the floor first and to share with us some of the global numbers? Hello, can everybody hear? Very good. Okay, um, so my name is Bob Ward. Um, you've actually promoted me beyond what I'm actually at the moment. I'm not the interim director of the Grantham Research Institute, policy and communications director. I'm the interim direct, executive director of, a, of the Grantham Research Institute called the Center for Economic Transition Expertise, a role I hope I only uh, carry out until Easter when we will have a permanent um, uh, executive director. Now, um, the Grantham Research Institute, along with the Brookings Institution, currently provides the secretariat to the independent high-level group, expert group on climate finance, which is co-chaired by Amar Bhattacharya, Vera Songwei, and Nicholas Stern. Uh, it has uh, been commissioned by successive COP presidencies to provide analysis and assessments of the flows of climate finance and investment that are required to deliver on Paris. And this morning at um, 9 a.m. Azerbaijan time, we published the third report. So what I'm going to do as a way of setting the context for this discussion is just run through some of the numbers from that report. And you'll have to forgive me for reading from, from my phone in order to make sure I get the numbers correct. So the report is mainly about how to mobilize finance for emerging market and developing countries outside China. But it does, it starts from the question, how much finance do we need to mobilize if the world is to deliver on the goals of the Paris Agreement? And it took that as an analytical question, not as a, a negotiation discussion. So the figures that have come we need to be uh, um, mobilizing 6.3 to 6.7 trillion dollars a year globally in order to deliver on Paris in a way that promotes um, the sustainable development. Of 6.3 to 6.7 trillion, 2.7 to 2.8 trillion will be in the advanced economies, investments in that. 1.3 to 1.4 trillion in China, and then 2.3 to 2.5 trillion dollars a year in the emerging market and developing countries other than China. So they're big numbers. Um, now, focusing on the 2.4 trillion in the uh, emerging market and developing countries, roughly 1.4 trillion would come from domestic resources, and a trillion would be required in external finance. And I will drill down very quickly into the external finance, but first let me just tell you that of that 2.4 trillion in the emerging market and developing countries outside China, 1.6 trillion would be invested in the clean energy transition, about 0.25 trillion, so 250 billion in adaptation and resilience, 250 trillion for loss and damage, 300 billion for natural capital and sustainable agriculture, and about 40 billion a year for fostering a just transition. So just talking about the external finance, which is a trillion dollars a year, the reason I'm going to very briefly talk about the composition of that because it's directly relevant to the discussions happening here at the moment about the new collective quantified goal on climate. Now, of the, uh, that uh, trillion, we expect that the composition of that will be, um, so let's start with the domestic mobilization. We think public finance will need to be about uh, 800 to 900 billion and then 550 to 630 billion in private finance. So that's the domestic mobilization. Of the trillion that needs to be external finance, about 450 to 550 billion is private finance. 
Now that private finance is not national finance. That's essentially the private sector, including Global South private sector, investing in the emerging market in developing countries. That's a roughly 15 to 18 times the amount of investment that is currently happening. The MDBs, the multilateral development banks, will need to be investing 240 to 300 billion a year by 2030. That's roughly a tripling of the current sums that they're investing. Bilateral public finance will need to be about 80 to 100 billion, which is roughly double current investments. Now, most of the, let's just for a moment, if I may, just centre people about the importance of the bilateral public finance. It is important, but it is by no means the majority of the finance that's required here. And there is concern about what will happen, say, if Donald Trump stops the US from providing any further bilateral public international climate finance. The sum that the US is intending to mobilize this year is 11 billion, right? 11 billion. That's 1% of the trillion that we are going to be needing by 2030. So it is unhelpful if the US does stop that, but it is by no means the whole game and the world can get on with mobilizing the sums required even if Donald Trump decides he wants to stop. So that's the, let me just round off the numbers. I appreciate I'm taking a little bit more time now. Okay, the South-South cooperation element of this external finance would be roughly 30 to 50 billion a year, about one and a half times or uh, uh, the current. And then other forms of concessional finance, uh, 140 to 160 billion, which is about 14 to 16 times the current levels. So I just wanted to provide those context of the scale of the challenges and where our focus need to be because uh, let me just mention that in terms of the, the NCQG, the NCQG is a peculiar combination of bilateral public finance, some multilateral uh, public finance and some directly leveraged private finance. With, when you do the calculation compared to this framework, it roughly implies that the NCQG should be roughly, or at least, a tripling of the 100 billion target that is currently in place and has been in place from uh, 2010. So thank you. Thanks for sharing. Uh, thanks for sharing all those numbers. Uh, some of them looks quite challenging, um, and uh, clearly um, that the majority of those finance would uh, needs to go to the emerging market. So quickly over to Suba, um, I would like to uh, hear from you because I know that um, ASCAP is you know um, serving um, of. 46 um, member states in the Asia Pacific region and you are there often talking to your members uh, member states so hearing what they really need in terms of uh, um, uh, the financing needs so yeah um, pl please share with us your thoughts thanks baby can you all hear me Perfect. Um, thank you so much to GF60, um, to DESA, to all of our partners. We are actually working very closely with CBI, with ADB and others in SCAP. Um, for those of you that don't know SCAP, we are the regional arm of the United Nations Secretariat. We have 53 member states covering Turkey to Vanuatu, and we provide technical assistance to ministries of finance and central banks on sustainable finance, as well as uh, providing research and think as a think tank on sustainable finance and intergovernmental facilitation for uh, regional cooperation and collaboration. So I think, you know, I think Bob, um, sorry, I'm going to call you Bob, <laughs> has, um, you know, laid out the challenge. But I would also say that, um, you know, I think the consensus is very much that the capital is there. We're not talking about creating um, through growth all of this sort of uh, capital. We're talking about reallocating capital. We're talking about having structures in place um, that do that effectively and efficiently. 
and I'll just talk about three areas um, that are critical for developing countries. One is around the fiscal space, and there's obviously a lot of discussion that uh, developing countries, particularly in Asia Pacific, uh, you know, at, at high risk of uh, indebtedness, many of them are approaching uh, debt distress already. Um, and there is a discussion that there is therefore limited fiscal space to uh, spend um, in attracting or mobilizing or funding um, green and sustainable finance. But if we look at the structure of how that fiscal space is organized, and particularly the subsidies, tariffs, incentives in place for certain harmful practices towards the SDGs versus the subsidy tariff incentive structure for incentivizing flows to the SDGs, we see you know, pretty much a, fundam a fundamental misallocation of how that fiscal space is organized. So that's number one. Number two on you know, mobilizing private finance. Um, you know, the discussion here at COP as well as uh, in the run-up to the fourth uh, international high-level conference on financing for development next year is very much on uh, how we can mobilize uh, private finance. I think, Bob, you said it was 15 to 18 times more than what we have now that is required. But private finance, including, let's say, deposit-taking banks to, say, more um, entities that can take on more risk, head funds, etc., that's a vast spectrum. Deposit-taking banks, which are the largest sources of pools of capital here in Asia-Pacific, cannot take on the kind of risk that needs to be faced in um, emerging markets or in some of the more challenging emerging markets. So governments have a role to play in pro producing policy coherence, policy consistency, in putting together long-term frameworks that enable that kind of uh, private finance, especially in energy and clean energy uh, investment, and in uh, setting forward a vision, like I think that's what we're talking about today, the vision for what a subnational or national platform can do and how integrated it can be with NDC planning, but also SDG planning um, and other factors. And right now, that it, it may seem very boring, this uh, coordination processes within government, but transport, energy, finance ministries are rarely in lockstep around this transition, which is where much of this has to happen. Um, and then finally on MDVs, I'm sure we'll, we'll get to that in, in due course. But I, I think there is a new culture required for MDBs to work in partnership with private finance, which is not the same as you know the call is to expand you know their lending to expand um, their risk taking abilities, but it's also a culture and deal making behavior in how they work with private finance and particularly in more um, challenging markets. So I'll stop there. I know we're running out of time. Thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, next, I'd like to go to Sean. Um, I know that you have been, you know, world, world tra traveling and visiting a lot of um, exciting markets and places and really hear Like Shanghai. Yeah, Shanghai. <laughs> so, um, um, we'd like to also hear your, your also, I think the previous two panelists uh, focused more on, the, you know, mar macro level and more on the global or national um, um, pictures. What, what are you hearing? What are you uh, seeing? Uh, maybe from a subnational, from a local um, level. What kinds of you know financial innovations? What kind of mechanisms um, and systems and and the strategies that that are on place at the city level uh, that 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 is worth sharing with with this audience? Well, I come. Our base is working with investors, and governments on the green bond and stable bond market. That's gone since we started from one and a half billion dollars outstanding to $5.4 trillion outstanding. It dwarfs the $100 billion figure, for example. That's actual cap capital moving the green investments. The Chinese market is now the world's largest national green bond market. For example, it's not just a, a European thing. That's been driven by the actions of regulators and governments. It's a created market, as most markets are a managed market with incentives, with guidance, and so on. It arose out of investors, not regulators. Regulators have now got onto it from central banks in China. The People's Bank of China has been critical to growing this particular market. We have on the next session that I'm speaking at with the Azeri Central Bank, we're launching a green taxonomy here in Azerbaijan, and so on. The guidance around what qualifies as green has been a critical part of this development. And I want to mention that because it's not just about mitigation now. When this started, this market was about renewable energy. It's now all sorts of transition investments as well. 
But because we have patently failed to act on climate change adequately in the last 30 years, and we're now going to hit 1.5 degrees next couple of years, according to the World Meteorological Organization, we now have a resilience agenda we need to pursue. We published the Climate Bonds Resilience Taxonomy a couple of months ago, which is a first stage. We did that with UN Disaster Risk Reduction and UN Women. We have pushed that out as guidance for governments about how to address resilience in the context of the volatility of the 21st century that's going to become crazy from now on. That, by the way, is the SDG. Because when we look at resilience, we don't just mean physical hardening of infrastructure. We need social resilience. We need economic resilience. We need health sector resilience. We need nature resilience. It picks up all the SDGs. And what we're saying is, it's not just the climate change SDG. Everything that we do in the SDGs is critical to being able to manage our societies to survive going forward in the 21st century. We need richer emerging markets to bounce back every time there's a food or a flat or um, green finance centers have been critical to development so far and will be going forward. These are essentially centers of expertise. So the work we're doing in Shanghai with GF60 and others is about growing Shanghai as a global center of green finance, of institutions to support the change. Of course, we've been doing that in London. I mean, in London, we have a wide variety of organizations from Grantham, from Climate Bonds Initiative and so on, working on growing it as a center of international green finance. We have a similar conversation in Casablanca, in Johannesburg, in Cairo, in Mumbai, in Hong Kong, in Singapore. This has been fantastic to bring together expertise and the support needed for other organizations to act. We did something in Singapore, training exercise, UNESCAP recently, for example. This is going to become an important part of the next stage of development because we need deal flow. We need investors to understand. We need stock exchanges to have green equity listings, not just green bond listings. We need the whole financial sector to start being focused on the green transition, the sort of thing that Bob talks about. That is actually starting to happen in Shanghai, which is one of the reasons I'm here today, but in other markets as well. We have a lot to do, though. I'm going to say that the numbers that the UN High-Level Commission is saying are actually modest. Are actually modest, I'm afraid, because we haven't yet understood the scale of change we need to achieve in our societies to address all the SDGs, to address our societies in the context I'll try another microphone I'll try I'll just hold it like that and not move um, we need to look at everything we do in society the government the one government that's doing this at the moment to my satisfaction is the Danish government they have a transition expert group in every single ministry looking at everything in every portfolio the government needs to do that's a clue it's not just the energy portfolio. It's not just the social portfolio. It's everything governments need to do. For that reason, it's all sorts of capital flows. Don't get me wrong. This is not necessarily new capital flows. We're, and by the way, we have more than enough capital in the world. There's no shortage of capital. All we've got to do is sluice the capital in the right direction to the right solutions. It's changing the procurement requirements. When we build a bridge in the future, we need to make sure we're putting in the right steel or the right wind shear tolerance levels to cope with typhoons that are twice or three times the strength. That's an example of how we adapt our current systems to climate. It's repurposing existing capital as well as new capital going forward. It's everything. We don't do this without the centers of excellence that green finance capitals like Shanghai, like Mumbai, like Singapore, provide us and that pro it provides us i'm going to say focus right now what we really need above everything is everyone to focus on the nature of the change to understand what's got to happen and then the capital will flow i'm very confident bob
Thank you, Sean. Um, always very, um, um, very good to hear your insight for um, take on this. Um, and I think you bring some really important and emergent topics related to the sustainable um, finance uh, going forward, such as resilience, which I would like to get back in the second round. Um, but now I would like to turn to Ms. Jilin. Uh, uh, we've heard a lot during the past few days about the NCGQ and also I think Ward has, um, has mentioned. So um, would you like to share a few words about you know, how an ADB, um, as one of the leading multilateral development banks in Asia, are, are doing, um, and uh, uh, particularly at the city level? Thanks a lot. It is also good to hear um, our speakers actually able to echo a lot of points that you've already mentioned. Uh, so ADB is actually uh, the chair of the multilateral development. ADB is actually the chair of the multilateral development bank um, in the NCQG negotiation among MDBs. Um, so uh, sorry. So um, I think two days ago, there's already a newly announced target from joint MDB declaration on the enhancement of MDB support to uh, climate actions uh, in, in the developing countries. So uh, for low income countries, the new goal is to provide 120 billion US dollars every year from MDBs to support climate actions. And then for high income countries, that number is uh, more than 50 billion uh, US dollars per year. Um, in addition to the mobilization of, of more private capital to support these actions. Um, so at ADB, we have also have a very ambitious climate target. Uh, we've already committed to uh, provide 100 billion US dollars uh, between 19, uh, 2019 to 2030 to support climate actions uh, in our developing member countries uh, in the Asia Pacific. And the goal is also actually um, to have a two key shift among ADBs. The uh, first one is the climate shift, and the second one is definitely actually the uh, private shift, which is to uh, integrating more collaboration between uh, sovereign and non-sovereign operations uh, within ADB to support and unlock uh, private finance to support more climate actions. Um, cities uh, in ADB is one of the core pillar of our uh, strategic priorities. Um, we have this priority called uh, making cities livable. Um, the, the definition of the livable is such a very broad idea which uh, intersects uh, many sectors within our bank. It includes energy, includes transport, includes uh, resilience and adaptation, etc. And, all, and it all starts actually with a very good in, uh, city planning, uh, the planning of how the infrastructure will be, how the nature-based solutions will be, and, and how uh, this overall design and the fiscal resilience will be. Um, so uh, within the bank, we've uh, provided a lot of technical support um, to city-level governments and, and planners um, on how to create um, bankable projects uh, at subnational levels. So this is not only about uh, how we can plan, but also how we can get finance to actually implement this planning uh, into action. Uh, we have projects in, in uh, China, in uh, Fujian province, uh, on coastal city resilience, which also integrates the consideration of nature uh, space solutions and also nature capital accounting to enhance uh, municipal uh, tax revenues from these projects and enhance their fiscal resilience. Um, so uh, we can talk more about that, but we also have a newly initiative called uh, Creating uh, Investable Cities, so which also aims to provide capacity building for um, uh, city governments um, on these, some of these uh, priorities and, and make uh, the more bankable projects um, achievable. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, excellent for the first round of um, inputs. Um, I think uh, it, it is pretty clear that from the first round, uh, we do see that there is a consensus that, okay, um, there is actually not a lack of capital globally, but what uh, really lacks is, you know, the um, all the important stakeholders, being government, being the financial institutions, being the, um, you know, all the all the service providers in this um, financial sectors, uh, working together to make sure that we have um, to 
to um, to make sure that we can direct the, the you know the capital and investment flow to reallocate those uh, towards um, projects and investment that are aligned with the Paris Agreement. So really making that capital reallocation happen um, at scale and at speed um, is really what we need. And how uh, the you know the city level stakeholders, for example, I mean my uh, my next question will be uh, to all of you uh, because uh, I know that in your day to day work that you interact a lot with different um, city level stakeholders, you know, from, for example, mayors, you know, government officials to the key financial institutions in, in, the, um, 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 in the market. So um, what would be your um, advice or, or, or how would you approach, how would you, how would you speak to them uh, about this important imperative, you know, how, how we can really uh, not convince, but, you know, make the case for them that the, uh, um, this capital allocation should happen and, and how it should happen. Perhaps I can start. Uh, one of the other hats I wear is as chair of the London Climate Ready Partnership, which brings together local government, um, companies, communities, and others in London who are concerned about climate resilience. And you face the same, cha you face particular challenges with resilience because it's not always obvious how investments in resilience create revenue and what the returns on the investment is. It's often viewed as a re the return on investment is very clearly and most obviously you're protecting economic activity and social activity. If you're not resilient, the things you build get destroyed. The activity you try to foster in the cities doesn't happen. Um, but there's a tendency amongst the private sector to think that the public sector will pay for all the resilience investments. And that's not correct. But by far the biggest challenge in cities and subnational areas is, and, and the biggest barrier to investment is the same at national level. It's policy risk. The fear that the policymakers will not provide clear, consistent policy making. And it, even more of a challenge at local level, and I know this in London, where there's a lack of cooperation and understanding and collaboration between national government and local government. In addition, there are still many people in charge of economic policy at local level who still don't understand that the investments in the green transition, in resilience and nature, they are the things that are going to drive sustainable growth and, and, and development. These are investments this is what will drive growth. There are still a lot of economists and economic decision makers who still think this is a cost. Well, the question is, if you think it's a cost, where exactly do you think you are going to invest your money at the moment if you want to drive growth? Is it going to be in high carbon? Is the future of growth going to be building more oil wells, mining more coal, building more petrol and gasoline driven vehicles? Well, you'd have to be fairly brave to make that suggestion given the overwhelming economic evidence that it's the investments in the new clean, efficient economy that will drive growth. And that understanding has to percolate into the economic decision makers. In London, they have, we are having that discussion right now about how to embed these investments in the growth plan. It's not about environmental policy, it's central to economic policy in London and getting economic decision makers to understand that if you want successful economic development and growth, you have to invest in clean energy transition. In fact, there is no other driver really of sustainable growth and development. And that applies in as much in advanced economies as it does in developing country economies as well, where most of the growth is going to occur. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, actually, in, in China, we, we have also um, uh, sort of like put, put those into a crystallized sentence, which is uh, green is gold, <laughs> uh, which, which, which was put forward by the President Xi. And uh, um, I think in, in China, we, we have also quite a few um, success stories to show that, you know, when, uh, when a city or when, uh, uh, when, uh, when, when a local government is, you know, um, 
fully understand, you know, by investing in nature, by investing in the environment, it can actually bring in, you know, thriving, um, thriving business based on, you know, the um, sustainable, um, um, sustainable um, 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 livelihood. Then it's it's actually a quite good stories and com convincing stories. So quickly over to Sean. Um, I know you have been visiting Shanghai quite often, so. Uh, if you're given a chance, what would be your piece of advice to the Shanghai government in, in, in uh, you know, developing this world-class world green finance hub? Well, we're already making progress in Shanghai, and this is the same story in all major economies. Uh, I, I will say the first bit of advice to any jurisdiction, but to cities, is to think domestically about how we change, how we are working. Okay, uh, there's an art to this. We need training next time. Uh, more karaoke. <laughs> um, think karaoke, says Bob. Okay. Um, it, we need to be looking about how we change the city. So in Shanghai, for example, energy system, Shanghai is shifting towards clean energy. We need to electrify everything in cities. Charging points for cars, electricity for the ships. In Shanghai, the government is looking at how to shift the ports over from fuel-based support for ships to electrification. So when super tankers lodge, they can plug into the, the power and stop using their bunker fuel generators, etc. Everything needs to electrify. We need to look at water and waste. In Shanghai, for example, there's not only the managing of clean water and making sure it's low carbon and resilient because rainfall's changing, right? It's gonna go drought, flood, drought, flood everywhere around the world. Shanghai has to adapt to that as well. It's also managing waste to make sure that waste management is low methane or we capture the methane and so on. It's about buildings. They have to be green, low energy and so on. So the new regulations required, but it's also, it's also about the social support required for Shanghai citizens when a crisis happens. Think about the lockdown during pandemics and how people kept that. Were we prepared? No. Did people suffer? Yes. We can do a lot more for next time to be ready, including funds to make sure unemployment relief is there. In Europe, for example, social bonds were issued to be able to fund un unemployment relief. Shanghai has to be thinking about these things in the future. Education, the training of a health sector staff to be our deal of pandemics. These are the sorts of things that come with climate change. What does nature look like in Shanghai, the future? The corridors for wildlife, the greening of the city, etc. Which is actually happening in Pudong where the greening is underway, but we need to do a lot more. That's the first stage. The second stage, which we've talked about, is the financial markets infrastructure. The Shanghai Stock Exchange now lists green bonds and has various green listings. We can do much more listing green, identifying investments that meet our green criteria so investors can choose a universe that's relevant for the future, not relevant for the past. There's more that we can do there. The training of the financial sector to make sure the accountants understand reporting around green, understanding the new ISSB and IFSR regulations, to make sure that the banks understand the opportunities to tag their portfolios, in China's case, to get green bonds and cheaper capital from the central bank by creating these programs. All have to do this. This then becomes an export opportunity. As we do that, we talk to other markets about how they take advantage of the domestic financial situation in Shanghai, this expertise that we develop, which is after all a, center, a global center for finance. And then we need to look for demonstration issuance because you know what? Big deals get people excited. You put out a billion dollar deal or bigger and everyone says, whoa, what was that? We need those kinds of deals. In Shanghai, we're pushing the government to do a $10 billion transition bond to match the first Chinese transition bond as a way of growing transition finance in Shanghai. They're interested, they're looking at it. And that is exactly the same advice we're giving to Hong Kong that now has a huge program of government issuance of green bonds to provide liquidity in the market to support the growth. It's the same advice given to Tokyo, to Singapore, to Mumbai, etc. These are the sort of things we can do. What we need is a league of cities around the world that work together to drive capital changes, the markets. We have that, UNDP has an association of sustainable finance centers, which is working on this, that Shanghai is a member of. But of course, 
What we do know is we need to do a lot more because Bob has shown how much capital we have to move. I'm saying and it's going to be more by the time we finished. The job is very, very large. We're only in the first stages. Shanghai, like every other capitals, capital of capital in the world, has still a long way to go. But at least, at least it started changing. And that is what's exciting about this moment in history. Thank you for all the recommendations. We will make sure that we know down and bring back this message to the government of Shanghai. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just quickly over to Suba because I know you will be on the run for your next event. So, uh, what will be your key messages uh, to you know, um, for example, local government in uh, in Asia Pacific? Thanks, baby. Um, let me know if you can't hear me. So, I think that subnational platforms, or let's say cities, look very different across Asia Pacific. I think Shanghai, Hong Kong, um, Singapore are in a class in a league of their own. And I think the rest of the world uh, is still struggling with that um, first green bond issuance, let alone a transition bond issuance. Secondly is, you know, despite the massive growth in GSS plus bonds, which of course CBI has been a, a great part of, um, the fact is emissions are rising. <laughs> And the fact is that uh, this, uh, the fact is that normal bonds, um, I think ADB put out a figure in Asia Pacific alone, ASEAN plus three markets, JSS plus bonds are only 2.3 percent of the overall bonds. It's about eight percent in Europe. Of course, we're not, you know, um, we're not Europe, and our region has different uh, different concerns and different, you know, ways of, of trying to enact what they want. So at the subnational level, there are two things. One is if you're trying to attract finance to your city itself to be invested in infrastructure, green buildings, et cetera, and that has its own track of ensuring planning, ensuring regulations, and ensuring policy consistency. The second is if you want to set up a new green capital center, like a stock exchange, um, a market, et cetera, that requires growing you know, the sustainable finance ecosystem. That means putting into place um, you know, the standards for asset managers, asset owners, project owners, verifiers, standard setters, all of that. And some markets we hope will become that, but not every subnational platform in the region can necessarily do that. Instead, they should also look to each other to look at where cross-regional capital can be raised and what standards can apply across the region around that. So I'll stop there for now. Okay, thank you. Um, and then oh, oh, over to Jean. And I, I think you shared um, um, previously some of the ADBs working in in China, working with the uh, some of the subnational governments. So, how has been the experience so far? And uh, any lessons or success stories to share? Yeah, I think first of all, um, in China, our experience is that um, the consensus among the central level government is, is pretty consistent in terms of the adaptation and resilience. Uh, but when you come down to subnational levels, very often at the provincial level, the city level, or county levels, um, they actually do not have very much concrete idea of what does resilience actually mean for their own sectors or, or government departments. Um, so what does it mean for, for, instance, for instance, the health systems, um, the uh, agricultural sectors, etc. So I think first of all, it is very important to actually have a very comprehensive climate risk assessment or adaptation assessment to, to give a very visualized idea of um, different government officials as to how these uh, risks will be uh, in different scenarios um, on that. And then so that we can reach a consensus uh, in terms of how to take actions uh, to make the cities and, and uh, the urban areas more resilient to climate risks. And the second one is uh, to have more innovative financing solutions for that. Uh, that includes, first of all, to uh, relieve government from their fiscal burdens. Um, so far in China, many uh, subnational governments actually are very uh, indebted uh, with their local uh, debt issues. So that actually created a lot of problems for our programs um, and, and their lending capacities to have more um, emphasis in terms of taking more ambitious climate actions, etc. So it, it is uh, needed actually to have more um, flexible fiscal arrangements uh, for government to have more capacities uh, to cope with these issues. Um, some of the, uh, these innovations could be a combination of, of sovereign and private sector collaborations. Um, for example, ADB has um, sort of piloted a combination of, of these, these sort of uh, lendings to state-owned companies instead of, instead of um, local governments. Um, the local governments will still guarantee our loans, 
but the loan was not actually di directly providing to the local government, but to their uh, locally owned state enterprises. So uh, first of all, it relieved the government burdens uh, so that they can borrow in, uh, and more money actually to uh, address other more pressing social issues and demands. And second of all, uh, we actually, through this sort of arrangement, improve the capacity of local SOEs in terms of their um, financial viability and, and commercial uh, lending uh, capacities. Um, and then the second of that is actually to unleash and unlock more private finance uh, through different uh, arrangements, in terms, including like government guarantees, uh, the special funding vehicles, etc., to uh, commercialize more uh, technologies and, and uh, finance some of these projects at city level uh, to increase uh, resilience. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, with that, um, I think uh, because the um, two of our panelists um, unfortunately have to leave for their next event, but um, I'm just thinking maybe taking this opportunity, I can quickly open uh, to the floor for maybe just one question. If you have any like burning questions to our two fantastic panelists here, uh, you, you can still have you know just one quick question before I hand over to Mr. Zhang for the closing remarks. Any, any questions from the floor? Uh, hi, thank you for your presentations. And I'm from China, but I'm currently studying at the LSC. So unfortunately, the speaker have left. But then, my question would for Mr. Mr. Shu. Yeah. So you work for the Shanghai government and know about like I mean not for the Shanghai government, but you know about their like their listing of green stocks in the Shanghai Stock Exchange. So. From my experience, I knew that a few consulting companies such as PwC, they have been like saying that although there's a huge progress in them listing about the green stock exchange, there's still, still like a big step forward for the Shanghai Stock Exchange because of the insufficient data quality. So even though they are like listing these stocks, they have insufficient data to allow them to align with those international standards. Just wondering what's your opinion on the next step for the Shanghai Stock Exchange to ensure the integrity. Thank you. Uh, good, good question. And this is relevant to all stock exchanges around the world. The national guidelines that the Shanghai Stock Exchange this, uh, was following from the CSRC, the, the securities regulator, were China-specific and there were differences with international guidelines. That caused a lot of problems. So it meant for international investors, they couldn't invest in things that were seen as green by the stock exchange, even though they met the local regulations. That changed a couple of years ago with the new green finance guidelines that the, all the regulators put out, and now it's significantly improved. It's now a minor deviation. There are still differences everywhere. We need to be looking for harmonization with global standards because we want to attract the big global investors. So Shanghai is conscious of that, or the exchanges, and that's been changed, as are the regulators. But it was a problem for a while. That still applies in some other places too. So for example, the taxonomies used by the Indonesian government have things in it that international investors will not touch. And that's being reviewed at the moment, and it'll be made more harmonious with the common ground taxonomy between Europe and China and of other national taxonomies because they want a level playing field for international investors and domestic investors. It's improving a lot. It'll get better. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm not really sure if we have uh, time for one more question, but maybe after this session and ends, you can, you can um, you can you can do more free uh, dialogues yeah so uh, with that i would like to thank uh, the two panelists that are still on the panel and also the the other two that who have to leave early for your excellent uh, contribution and remarks thank you so much let's give him uh, let's give them a round of applause thank you Okay, so now uh, let's welcome Mr. Zhang Xiaohua, Senior Director of Climate Works Foundation, to uh, deliver closing remarks. Um, Climate Works Foundation has been our essential partner um, in China, helping us uh, to support the Shanghai government in uh, uh, in developing the green finance hub. So, uh, welcome, Mr. Zhang. 
Yeah, thank you very much, baby. It's um, a great pleasure to join the discussion here today. It's, uh, but quite uh, also challenging to give some remarks after the real climate finance expert. Um, but this year it's um, labeled as uh, as a finance corp, so it's um, um, so we're really happy to join this conversation and uh, just uh, from all this uh, enlightening uh, discussion, share some some uh, uh, reflections from my side. Um, we all know that there's an intensive uh, negotiation on this uh, new co the called new collective the qualified go NC. Uh, GQ, uh, QG um, and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, following the conversation from the expert we know that the climate need a, um, a, a vast amount of the uh, capital but I think uh, this new goal is still quite if, uh, essential uh, for uh, uh, in, uh, build the confidence of the all uh, global climate efforts to move forward uh, even this is just a small piece of the capital uh, needed so really um, hope the, the negotiation will um, uh, result in a, in a very good outcome in this COP. Uh, but having said that, I think more importantly is we, we have to look at the whole picture. Like all these uh, experts uh, mentioned that uh, the capital is, is there. The more important uh, issue is how we can mobilize this, uh, how we channel the capital into the right direction. I think this is uh, uh, the task we all need to, 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 to make effort to uh, address. I think particularly this uh, um, uh, are closely rele relevant to the topics we are discussing here today at the uh, Sustainable Finance Hub. And we really need to build the uh, infrastructure, hardware, software, everything to channel all this capital available to the right direction. I think this is a, a really, it's, it's a long-term effort, but it's, uh, it's really things we need to do. And uh, I think in this regard, I think a city certainly play a very important role. We see a lot of hub has already emerging, like in Shanghai, in Hong Kong, in London, but we really need more. Um, this is also one of the tasks as my organization, Climate Works Foundation, is uh, dedicated to do. So we're very, very happy to work with the GF60 uh, uh, on well, help the Shanghai to build their uh, the, the sustainable finance hub. So it's really important uh, task, we think, to move forward. Um, but also beyond that, I think there's more infrastructure we need uh, to build uh, on the way to advance the climate finance. Uh, maybe just to highlight a, a bit of this, uh, some of the efforts we ha have been making in, the, uh, in, in this area. Like uh, we need to mainstream in the transition and plan practice uh, um, uh, more into the, uh, uh, when we advance the transition finance because only with the reliable tran transition plans uh, uh, really we can um, convert the uh, translate the, the net zero emission uh, target into, into the actionable target. Um, and the second thing is uh, we really need to uh, capitalize on this uh, innovative transition finance solutions. We, we certainly uh, has a lot of uh, uh, investment need, uh, but we also have a lot of uh, new solutions. Uh, and really how to mobilize the finance into these uh, solutions, we need a lot of uh, new instruments and uh, solutions like uh, the expert mentioned of the blended finance and also different uh, bonds, etc. I think this is uh, something we need to uh, uh, further uh, 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 strengthen this, uh, this, uh, the, the, the solutions in this area. And the third thing I think is also very important is uh, advancing the carbon accounting and establishes a really a, a carbon neutral or green supply chain. I think it's more important to make sure that we know this, the uh, finance we mobilize uh, really convert into a carbon uh, neutrality uh, reality in the, in the, in the future. Um, we know that uh, the future is there. We know the, the challenge is, uh, is uh, still very big, but we, I think we have the hope we see the uh, directions and uh, by working together, we really, we, I, I, I'm confident we can convert this vision into uh, reality. So with that, uh, thank you very much uh, and a really uh, great uh, conversation. And uh, I think uh, to be continued uh, for the next uh, session. Yeah.